days on end with no food or water, drinking buffalo blood or eating bugs to stay alive, drugged, kidnapped and left for dead in 40 degrees Celsius heat of the unforgiving desert. Stranded with no sign of life, disorientated and vital organs begin shutting down, but miraculously they survived. From 70 days after being left for dead to an autistic boy who used indigenous methods to overcome his dire predicaments. These are five incredible Outback survival stories. Welcome back to another episode of Shadow Matter. Today we're going to be looking at some of the most amazing true life stories of survival in the remote and vast expanse of the Australian outback. Hello, my name is Dennis and I am very thirsty. These were the first words that 14 year old Dennis Dare muttered to his rescuers in the rugged bush at Flint, Western Australia in the Mandaring State Forest on New Year's Eve 2012. Dennis and his father, Peter, along with a group of friends, set off for a camping and biking excursion on New Year's Eve weekend 2012. It was one of the first trips Dennis and his father had taken together after a seven-year separation. The group arrived at a popular camping and biking site at 6am December the 30th, and 30 minutes later, Peter realised his son was missing. The father quickly worried for his son's safety, as he had autism and a little bit of cerebral palsy. Adding to that, Peter believed his son didn't take any water with him. The search quickly began and other bikers tried to help, but they failed to find him. The official search started after authorities were notified at 7.20 a.m. There were fears for Dennis as the day went on and the temperature soared to 42 degrees Celsius. More than 70 volunteers, state emergency services and police scoured the bush to locate Dennis. Even a police helicopter with night vision was called in to help. As dusk set in, they happened upon Dennis's bike in a ditch. The bike's chain was broken. The keys and the boy's helmet and gloves were missing. Police and searchers continued patrolling bush tracks in their vehicles throughout the night as visibility was too low for officers on foot. Dennis's mother Kay also joined the search after learning of her son's disappearance and expressed her fears to local authorities and newspapers that the seriousness of the situation would not register with her son. Quote, it wouldn't phase him at all as such. Even when he sees the search, he wouldn't realize it's about him." End quote. Kay was hopeful her son, who was solidly built and around 180 centimeters tall, would be able to survive the night, also explaining that Dennis had experience in Boy Scouts and learned traditional Aboriginal methods of survival. With low visibility during the night, the search was paused at 10.30 p.m. and picking up back in the morning, but at the 24 hours mark, the reality of the situation finally hit the family. At 11 a.m., an SES volunteer spotted a footprint in the sand. They decided to cover another four kilometers before heading back to base. About 500 meters down the track, Dennis came wandering out from the side of the road, covered in dirt. He hugged one of the SES volunteers and said, Hello, my name is Dennis and I am very thirsty. Relieved by everyone that Dennis was safe, he recalled his survival tactics of sipping small amounts of water from plants while snacking on lollies that had been left by SES volunteers to let Dennis know that they were searching for him. He had also covered himself in dirt to help shield his skin. Police said that these tactics potentially saved the teenager. The young man finally reunited with his family and gave his mother a big hug as a crowd of searchers and police applauded. Fifty-three-year-old Victorian Theo Rosmolder, along with his wife and a group of friends, set out from Victoria to Laverton in Western Australia for a gold prospecting trip in July of 2008. Theo had been searching for gold with his wife and a group of friends about 130 kilometres north of Laverton when he became lost. Armed with only a pocket knife, torch and a metal detector, he wandered off alone towards a large outcrop of granite. By the time it was getting dark, Theo realised he was lost when he couldn't see the group or the car and it was now getting too late to use the sun to find his bearings. As it got colder, Theo had to find shelter for the night as the temperature dropped. He found a hollow in the rocks where kangaroos would sleep, crawled into it, and covered himself with branches. The next day, cloud cover prevented Theo from being able to use the sun to find his sense of direction. Carrying no food or water, Rosmolder knew he was in trouble after a whole day and night of being lost, but his career back home came in handy. Quote, I'm a pest control bloke from back home, so I knew a bit about insects and whatnot. I knew termites had a high protein, so I was eating a lot of those. I just hit the top of the termite nest off and get stuck into them." End quote. The only moisture Theo was able to obtain came from plants in the morning and from licking rocks at night. But even with the little hydration and source of food that Rosmolder was able to get, it wasn't enough to ward off hallucinations. 
As the days went past, Theo's spirits fell and he began to consider that he might never be found. One of the days, Theo saw a search plane fly overhead. He tried to get its attention by waving his clothes and yelling at it, but the plane didn't see him and continued flying past. On the fourth day of being lost, Theo was losing energy and failed to walk more than a few meters at a time before he had to stop. His hopes of being rescued seemed slim and he scratched a final message to his family on his torch. Just as Theo thought all was ending, he heard gunshots. He whistled. A yell came in response. He whistled again. He heard another yell. Two men from a local Aboriginal community were out shooting that morning and spotted Theo. It was just magic, he said of his rescue. I just collapsed. The men took him back to his camp, which he was 10 kilometers away from. He was treated at Laverton Hospital and told officials that he planned to continue his gold hunting holiday. Rod Ansell was a cattle grazier and a buffalo hunter based in the top end of the Northern Territory. Ansell became famous in 1977 after he was stranded in the remote region of the Northern Territory and the story of his survival for 56 days with limited supplies reached headlines around the world. And he was also the inspiration for Paul Hogan's character, Mick Dundee, in the 1986 film, Crocodile Dundee. In 1977, after completing a buffalo catching job, Ansel decided to travel to the Victoria River on what he claimed was a fishing trip, although various others claimed he was really going to illegally poach crocs. He told his girlfriend at the time he would be returning in a few months, taking with him a rifle, a knife, some canned food, bedding, and traverse the river in his small dinghy. He claims he was capsized by, quote, something big. Rod was left stranded almost 200 kilometers from the nearest settlement, and one of his dogs had a broken leg. During the night, Ansel's dinghy drifted out to sea, eventually washing up on a small island in another river. Over the next few weeks, Ansel fed himself and his dogs by hunting wild cattle and buffalo, and had to resort to drinking their blood as there was a lack of fresh water in the rivers. He was also able to retrieve honey from beehives and took to sleeping in trees to keep out of reach of crocodiles. Although, he did share a tree with a brown snake. Rod never thought he would be rescued as he told others that he would be gone for a month and in turn negating the possibility of a search party. Plus, he was in another river as opposed to the one he had mentioned to others. One day, Rod heard horse bells, which drew him to two Aboriginal stockmen and their stock manager. Once back home, he kept his seven-week ordeal to himself, fearing he would upset his mother with his recklessness. He later made headlines, and newspapers dubbed him the modern-day Robinson Crusoe. He brushed off his celebrity status as not a big deal, and some people have reserved skepticism about his survival story. Molly Craig was born in Jigalong, Western Australia, around 1916 or 17. Her mother was a Matu Aboriginal woman, and her father was a white Australian fence inspector for the pest fence known as the Rabbit Proof Fence. A massive fence that runs 1,833 kilometers and crosses through the state from north to south and was constructed in the early half of the 20th century as a means to control infestation of pests such as rabbits. Also around this time, children of mixed indigenous and white parentage were frequently removed from their families and placed in institutions or with white families as domestic servants. In 1931, Molly, who was around 14, her half-sister Daisy, 8, and her cousin Gracie, 11, were taken from their families and transported over 1,600 kilometers to the Moor River native settlement north of Perth. The girls wasted no time in leaving their current predicaments and escaped the very next day after arriving at the settlement. They walked to find the rabbit-proof fence, knowing if they followed it north, it would lead them back home to Jigalong. The girls crossed a flooded river, sand dunes, red dirt, and faced the extreme wilderness of the outback in bare feet. They also slept in dugout rabbit burrows, caught and cooked rabbits, and ate sweet potato and wild bananas. Molly even piggybacked the younger girls in turn. Their journey over 1,600 kilometers took nine weeks before they were reunited with their families in Jigalong. The remarkable feat was immortalized in a book authored by Molly's daughter, and then again as a 2002 film, The Rabbit Proof Fence. If you would like to learn more about this, I have linked the sources of information in the description below. In January 2006, Ricky McGee accepted a job for a government department in Port Hedland, Western Australia, and was driving along the Bunting Highway, which for much of his journey was a desert track across the outback. According to McGee, he had spotted three men sitting on the roadside who had run out of petrol. Ricky offered one of them a lift back to the petrol station. At some point during the trip, McGee states that he became overcome with a feeling of drowsiness and confusion. 
He believes that his drink may have been drugged by his passenger. He recovered consciousness hours later in a camp that the three men had made. He states they had a gun, but they never used it. After an unknown period, the carjackers lifted camp and disappeared. They took his car, his shoes, but left him with $12.30 cash he had in his pocket. When he regained consciousness, Ricky McGee found himself in a hole covered in tarpaulin, which had been weighed down by rocks. McGee then walked for 10 days in the Tanami Desert. The temperatures soared above 40 degrees Celsius, which would cause him to lose consciousness due to heat exhaustion. He states he survived on eating leeches, grasshoppers, and sun-dried frogs. He was also incredibly lucky as the outback was in its wet season, in which he would be able to source water from various dams and waterholes. When water wasn't available, he drank his own urine. He would create shelters out of old branches and eventually settled beside a feed trough where he stayed there for 10 weeks. McGee was eventually discovered about 50 kilometers from the nearest cattle station by some jackaroos. He was sunburnt, starving, and delirious. The station manager described McGee as just a walking skeleton. He was taken to hospital and interviewed by police who could not locate McGee's stolen car. Ricky discharged himself after six days. It should be noted that McGee's accounts have been highly doubted by various news outlets and other skeptics, most likely due to the contradictions in his changing story over the years and certain details that don't add up. However, a few survival experts have come to McGee's defense and stated that it is entirely possible for someone to survive in the area he was in. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for stopping by, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Five incredible stories of survival in the outback. If you made it this far in the video, congratulations. And if you would like to be featured in the end section like this comment right here, then leave a comment below starting with shadow shout out. And don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.